Hello and welcome to the London West 2015 candidates debate, the local focus on the federal election. My name is Jess Brady and I will be your moderator for today's program. We have six candidates who have joined us today to take part in our debate, but before we meet them, let's learn a little bit more about the riding they hope to represent in Parliament. London West is an 80 square kilometre riding which stretches along the city's western boundaries down to Southdale Road and eastward to Warncliffe. It also takes in the northwest portion of the city. The riding includes many unique areas of London such as Byron, Wortley Village and Hyde Park. The west part of the city is in expansion mode with lots of commercial development and highway improvements on the way. There are close to 130,000 residents in London West and 91,000 are eligible to vote. The average family's after-tax income is just over $65,000 and 72% of the riding's residents have post-secondary education. Conservative MP Ed Holder has held the riding for the last two terms, but previous to that the Liberals were in control from 1993 to 2008. Rogers TV, the local focus on the federal election. Now that we've learned all about the riding of London West, let's meet our candidates. First up, we have Michael Lewis of the Communist Party. Next, Liberal Party candidate Kate Young. From the Green Party, Dimitri Lascaris. From representing the Conservative Party of Canada, we have incumbent MP Ed Holder. Then we have representing the Libertarian Party, Jacques Boudreau. And last but not least, New Democrat candidate Matthew Rowlandson. Thank you to all of our candidates for taking part today and being here. Before we get going, we're going to take just a moment to go over the format of today's debate. Each candidate will have one minute to make an opening statement to introduce themselves. They will then have one minute to answer each of our pre recorded questions from members of the London media. Rebuttals will be allowed at my discretion and candidates will have 30 seconds to reply. Each person will also have an opportunity to make a closing statement. As we hear from our candidates, we also want to hear from those of you tuning in at home. Feel free to share your thoughts on Twitter by using the hashtag RTVLocalCampaign. And if you're looking for more information about our debate series in <coughs> general, be sure to go to our local campaign page at RogersTV.com. Information about the election itself can be found on Elections Canada's website at elections.ca. We'll have all of that information displayed on the screen throughout the debate, so don't worry about writing it all down. You'll have plenty of opportunities to catch it all. Now, without further ado, let's begin our debate. Our candidates drew for their response order and we will start our opening uh, statements with Michael Lewis. All right. Um, good afternoon. And thank you for having me here today. Uh, my name is Michael Lewis and I represent the Communist Party of Canada. Um, I don't need to tell anybody that the status quo is not working nor is it sustainable. Uh, we heard just this morning that the country is officially in a recession. Um, what Canadians need and deserve is full employment, not McJobs, not part-time, um, and they deserve employment with a decent living wage. Um, I believe that what they want uh, is properly funded health care, child care, and education, and most importantly, equality. Um, they want NPs that will defend the working class. Uh, That's what we stand for. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll go to Liberal candidate Kate Young. Thank you very much, Jess. I am running as the Liberal candidate in London West because I am concerned about the future of this city and the lack of opportunity and confidence that we have in the region. I care deeply about London West. My parents moved here when I was three years old. I was raised in London West. I raised my family here and I live here now. And we all know what a great city London is to raise a family. And I am blessed that my son and daughter-in-law and twin grandsons live close by in Old South. But I worry about the future that my grandsons will have in London West. We can't simply point our finger at uh, the local politicians or provincial leaders. We have to point to Ottawa where their lack of leadership has really made uh, a, a terrible difference in London. We deserve better and I believe a federal Liberal Party will bring better uh, confidence in this region. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We'll go to Dimitri Lascaris from the Green Party. Thank you. Uh, well you're going to hear a lot about uh, change in this election uh, and certainly after uh, nearly a decade of conservative mismanagement of the economy nearly a decade of assaults on our civil liberties, nearly a decade of uh, the dismantling of essential environmental protections, 
The vast majority of Canadians want change and they want progressive change. And the question in this election is who's going to provide it. Now, on the one hand, you have the Liberals who supported Bill C-51, probably the greatest assault on our civil liberties in our lifetimes. And on the other, you have Tom Mulcair, who aspires to be Margaret Thatcher and who will prioritize balancing the budget over pulling Canada out of a conservative-made conservative recession. The, the Green Party offers the one alternative for change. We will not prioritize balancing a budget over pulling Canada out of a recession. We will reconstruct our environmental laws and protect our future and our children from catastrophic climate change, and we will repeal C-51. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll go to incumbent MP, Conservative Representative Ed Holder. Well, thanks, Jess, and thanks, Rogers Television. Let me acknowledge my colleagues around the table for their willingness uh, to serve. You know, it reminds me of my own family's uh, commitment to serve. You see, my dad and his two uncles uh, uh, were in the Second World War. One never came home. He was buried in Belgium. But through it all, my Cape Breton mom instilled in me that community service is the price you pay to live somewhere, and I've tried to live to that ideal in the community groups in which I've served and which I've led. As a business owner in London, I balanced a budget and had the honor to have 160 people uh, work with me. My wife's a small business owner, and we certainly understand the importance of job creators in London. Seven years ago, you gave me the privilege to serve as your member of parliament, and 18 months ago, Prime Minister Harper invited me to the cabinet table as Minister of Science and Technology. Friends in a fragile global economy were on the right path. Low taxes for Canadians and Canadian job creators, as well as balanced budgets, will determine Canada's greatness. I look forward to doing that with you. Thank you very much. We'll now go to Jacques Boudreau from the Libertarian Party. Thank you. The power of government over its citizens is fundamentally based on coercion, and the tool of choice is taxation. A recent study revealed that a Canadian household earning $79,000 pays an astonishing 42% of its income in taxes, while only paying 37% for the basic necessities of shelter, food, and clothing. This 42% is up from 40% in 2008 and 33% in the early 1960s. The Conservatives, Liberals, and NDP all favor these increasingly large governments and applaud the fact that you pay more in taxes than you do for necessities. Politicians and faceless bureaucrats over whom we, the people, have very little control increasingly use their power to infringe on our freedom by claiming to be better stewards of our money than we are. The Libertarian Party is adamantly opposed to this set of affairs and is the best party to significantly reduce the size of the wasteful government. Thank you. Thank you. We now go to our NDP candidate, Matthew Rowlandson. Thank you, Jess. This is an historic election. For 148 years, Canadians have only ever had liberal and conservative governments. Today, millions of voters across our country and tens of thousands in London, in London West are thinking of switching to the NDP. The NDP's federal breakthrough in 2011 and our provincial win in Alberta this year show that Canada's politics are changing. And it's about time. For three decades, globalization and the growth of big corporations have massively impacted Canada. The other two national parties have responded by writing off our manufacturing sector and doubling down on the oil industry. Their decisions have been bad for London and bad for the country as a whole. In this election, they're responding to our second recession in five years with the same old formulas. Federal mega projects funded by deficit spending from the Liberals and tax cuts for the rich from the Conservatives. The NDP offers a better plan and a new politics. Thank you very much, candidates. Those were your opening statements. We will now move on to our first question of the debate, and it has to do with the economy, and it comes from Pat Maloney of the London Free Press. London has struggled to recover from the 2008 recession, though there are recent signs of real recovery. What can your party do to speed up that turnaround here? Okay, and the first reply will come from Kate Young, our Liberal candidate. Thank you, Jess. It is true that uh, the London area has suffered greatly over the past 10 years as the Harper government has led uh, this country. We're in a recession and we have to do something to get out of that recession. And it's only the Liberal Party that is offering a real plan. And that includes infrastructure and putting more money back into the economy to get our middle income Canadians working again. We're also calling for cuts in the income tax rate for middle income Canadians and a new, better, fairer uh, Canada child benefit to uh, give to all middle-income Canadians and 
those who are working hard to become middle income because we know that if we have a strong middle class, we have a strong Canada. And that is imperative for not only Canada, but this region, because we must get people working again. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will go to Dimitri Lascaris from the Green Party now. Well, I think the key to the Green Party's approach is going to be investment, massive investment in renewable energy. Uh, Germany, which has a population roughly twice the size of Canada, maybe a little more, actually employs 370,000 people in the renewable energy sector. Last year, it generated 30% of its electricity from renewable energy. In this country, we generate, we have only 23,700 people employed in that sector, who, by the way, uh, that nonetheless outnumbers the number of people who are uh, employed directly by the tar sand sector. So there's enormous opportunities for growth, and we're going to put a price on carbon, which is going to cause and incentivize private sector to invest massively in the renewable energy sector. And we think that holds the key to job growth in this country. Okay, thank you very much. To our conservative candidate, Ed Holder, please. Well, thanks very much. Um, we all remember 2008, 2009, where we went through the worst recession of all of our lifetimes. And it was such a great challenge. And at that time, uh, our federal government made significant investments uh, into infrastructure based on a temporary, uh, organized basis. Uh, that had a plan to repay it. What has happened is that uh, since that time, there's good news for London. Some 16,000 net new jobs have been created since that uh, recession, 87% uh, of those full-time. You know, just even recently in June, some 4,700 jobs were created in, uh, then and 2,500 more in July. Uh, there's some positive news with respect to, uh, to London, Ontario. General Dynamics Land Systems uh, signed the, the greatest contract in the history of Canada in terms of export. Canadian Solar opened up, Dr. Edgar opened up, Natra. We've got so many great success stories here, and I'm optimistic, and I contrast that with the high-tax approach that is intended to be taken by the Liberals and the NDP. This is not the time for that, not in this fragile economy. Thank you very much. We move to our Libertarian candidate, Jacques Boudreau. Thank you. There's a common misconception among all the parties here that uh, central planning, that the government getting involved can actually resolve anything. That is simply not true, which is why election after election, we go through exactly the same problem, which is we have the opposition party that accuses the party in power to have mismanaged the economy. I mean, you could play the tape of this and just substitute the parties. It's always the same. The bottom line here is that the government cannot do anything other than getting out of the way. I'd like to point out that the golden age of economic growth in this country were in, in the 1800s, four, four and a half percent growth annually. We haven't come close to this, and this was at the time where the government was a tiny fraction of what it is today. So this very idea that the government can come in and somehow you know, manage the economy just does not work, and it's never worked, and it cannot work. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll go to NDP candidate Matthew Rawlinson now. As Ed said, we've all lived through the greatest recession in any of our lifetimes. It began in 2008. We are now in a second recession. Canada's economy as a whole has yet to bounce back from 2008. We're still 2,000, 200,000 jobs short of where we were there. Some jobs have come back to London. What I hear on the doorsteps as I canvass in London West is that a lot of Londoners who have jobs are underemployed. A lot of people who lost jobs in the manufacturing sector are now working at minimum wage or service jobs without benefits, often on a contract basis. It's not good enough. The NDP proposes to support small businesses that are growing here in London, to make a break with what has been the conservative approach of offering tax breaks and subsidies to big international corporations who can leave, who can pull up and leave London. We need to support local businesses that will build here and that will stay here and that will hire our people here in London. Thank you very much. We now go to uh, Michael Lewis of the Communist Party. <coughs> um, when it comes to jobs, um, the problem is, is that in the last 10 years, um, corporate tax rates have been cut from roughly 36 to 26 percent um, under the guise of creating jobs. Well, this obviously hasn't worked. Um, what we need is investment, um, state investment on infrastructure uh, and housing, um, revitalizing the uh, manufacturing sector, um, and the extra funds that we have in the public coffers from making sure that large corporations do pay their tax, and not just the 26%, the which they really don't pay. The vast majority pay around 80%, uh, or 10%, rather. Um, which is which is just ridiculous. Um, <clears throat> so uh, closing loopholes, 
uh, canceling tax havens, all of that would uh, would be able to um, fund a lot of investment in infrastructure and whatnot. Thank you. Excellent. So we will stay with the economy for our next question, and it has to do with what we've just been talking about, the recession in 2008. Uh, it's been a struggle for many Canadians, especially for families. It's hit people hard. What would your party do to make life more affordable for Canadian families? And we will go to Dimitri first for your response. Well, I think the, the, the key, as I say, is job growth. Uh, that is going to require us to uh, invest massively in the industry of the future, which is renewable energy. We need also to redistribute some income, uh, frankly, through social programs from corporations uh, to the uh, working class and the middle class. And uh, in fact, the situation is much, much worse than Mr. Lewis indicated. The corporate tax rate is down to 15 percent, and uh, the NDP is only proposing to raise it slightly. Uh, Mr. Mulcair said recently, recently that he was going to raise it uh, to somewhat less than the average during the Conservative years, which is 17.5 percent, and the Liberals don't want to raise it at all. And now individuals are paying more in taxes, uh, they have more of the tax burden than corporations do in this country. That needs to change. The Green Party is going to raise the tax rate to 18 percent and redistribute that money where it's needed. Okay, thank you very much. We go to our Conservative candidate, Ed Holder. Well, thanks very much. Look, what we all understand is that the global economy r remains fragile. You just have to see what happened recently in Greece and you look at the issues of China and the impact that that's had even in terms of our own stock market. Let me give you a sense of, of where we are as a country. The Bank of Canada, the OECD and the International Monetary Fund are all projecting a year of economic growth in Canada. In fact, we have the strongest record of economic growth, job creation and income growth amongst the middle class of any of the major developed countries. You can't just sit on that, but I think that's reason for us to be optimistic. It would, though, be the worst time for Canada and for Canadians to raise taxes, particularly in a fragile global economy. That's the greatest concern that we have to have because, frankly, what that would do is that would disin disincent the tax creators and, and all we need to know is the impact of jobs in London, Ontario, to understand that when you tax the job creators, they'll make different decisions. Thank you very much. We go now to Jacques Boudreau of the Libertarian Party. Thank you. The only way to increase standard of living is to let the free market and entrepreneurs act in a way as to produce goods and services that are affordable to people through innovation, through capital goods investment that allows us to produce more and eventually for less. This is the best way and we have to cut back on bureaucracy, red tape. It is astonishing people who want to start a business in this city, in this country, what they have to go through in order to start one. And many people simply turn away and do not because the, the, gain, the potential gains are not worth the effort and the, the rigmarole that they have to go through. This is, this is unconscionable. We are losing people with bright minds to other countries because they cannot operate in this one. Thank you. All right, we go to our NDP candidate, Matthew Rowlandson now. Let's be clear, we still aren't back as a country to where we were before 2008. And we are the only G7 country to have gone into a second recession. This is the Conservatives' record and it's a terrible one and people are suffering because of it. The question was how to make life affordable here in London. And I agree with all the others who, all the others who have spoken to say the key, part of the key here is jobs. The NDP will raise corporate taxes on large corporations, and we will use that money partly to fund a tax cut for the small companies, the startup companies that create 70% of the jobs. To make life more affordable, we will also establish a child care, a child care system that will make it possible for families, for growing families, to put their children in care without having to break the bank to do it, and without having to say, it costs me more to put my child in care than I'm going to make by going out and, and getting a job. People who have talents and skills to give to the economy will re-enter the workforce, and that will make us all richer, and it makes life easier for London families. Thank you very much. To Michael Lewis now. <coughs> um, to raise the level of wealth for, um, <coughs> for uh, people that are you know, obviously unemployed and or underemployed uh, or working for um, uh, very low wages, obviously, as I stated before, um, we will invest, invest in... Uh, <clears throat> in um, projects such as raising the minimum wage to $19 an hour, um, <clears throat> introducing a basic living allowance, um, 
I mean, even Henry Ford knew that, you know, if he paid his, his workers properly, they could afford to buy his products. So when you put more hands into the people that need it and, and don't have to spend every bit of money that they make on the necessities, then they can go out and buy products made by Canadian companies and otherwise. Um, and the cycle continues. Thank you. Okay, next we have Kate Young representing the Liberals. Thank you, Jess. Canadian families are worried if they're going to have enough money uh, to retire. They're worried about pensions. They're also worried about if they're going to have enough money to uh, pay for their children's education. And it hasn't gotten any better since 2008, and it continues to get worse. And the Liberal Party is the only party of the three main parties that's willing to tax the very wealthy, the top 1% of Canadians, and uh, in order to be able to cut taxes for middle-income Canadians. We have to get the middle income and those working hard to join the middle income working mm -hmm. again. And the best way to do that is to cut taxes for middle income Canadians. Thank you very much. We now move, oh, yes, Should would you? Uh, sure, I guess I think so, and why not? Let's, let's go ahead, go ahead, Jacques. Okay, I'd like to address these comments about increasing taxes on corporation. Uh, there seems to be that, um, I don't know, money grows on trees or whatever, uh, which is not the case. If you increase, Taxes on corporations, I mean corporations then just become um, co tax collectors for the government because corporations tax their money, uh, sorry, uh, price their products on an after-tax basis, which means that if you, if you increase taxes, then they'll have to increase um, prices or they'll have to pay their employees less. It has to come from somewhere. Now, I know, uh, Ed, you've indicated that you would like to say something to that. Kate, would you like to reply or? Well, he's talking corporate taxes and the Liberals are not going to increase corporate taxes. Okay, and we'll go in order. So we'll go, we'll go to Ed next and then we'll get to Matthew, okay? You know, it's interesting when, uh, when I hear uh, my friend from the NDP talk in terms of uh, uh, increasing taxes on the job creators and, uh, and Liberals talking about uh, taxing the highest income uh, individuals I just wonder which company are they willing to sacrifice when I think of this you know is General Dynamics the next to go or Trojan Technologies or which one of those is going to be the next out the door when you put a higher tax regime in place that makes no sense okay Matthew go ahead corporate profits in this country are at a record high when he was governor of bank the Bank of Canada Mark Carney spoke of one of the major problems of in affecting the Canadian economy as dead money that is to say, corporations are making huge profits and they cannot find investment opportunities in the economy that the, the Conservatives have built. What we, that money is there, it needs to be invested, and some of it, corporations could afford to pay some of it to in taxes, to a government that will use it in infrastructure and social structure investments. Now, I know you wanted to have a chance to offer your thoughts on that. Unfortunately, we have to move along for time's sake, uh, but we will try and get in there. Next opportunity, you want to offer up some extra thoughts. So we're going to Devin Peacock now of AM 980 with his question. Single Canadians are one of the fastest growing demographics in the country. People living on their own make up over a quarter of Canadians today. Tax breaks for families far outweigh tax breaks for singles. What will your party do to help this demographic that deals with urbanization, income equality, and poverty to name three issues? Okay, so this question goes first to Conservative candidate Ed Holder. Well, thanks very much. I appreciate the question as well. I think what we've tried to, to do as a Conservative government is strike a balance across the whole uh, of, uh, of, of spectrum of Canadians, which is why our benefits provide uh, universality across the spectrum. What you see is whether you're a two-parent uh, uh, a two-parent family, a single-parent family, you have opportunities to provide to receive significant benefits through the universal child care benefit, through income splitting, things that uh, our colleagues here are looking to take away from the Liberals and the NDP. But the other thing is that we've lowered the tax levels at every level of income right across the spectrum, from seniors to to working families, to individuals on their own. That's significant because that's money that gets reinvested back in the Canadian economy. A high tax policy is not the kind of thing that is appropriate for this economy. It's not good for, for jobs. It's not good for the London economy. And frankly, I would ask uh, my colleagues opposite to reconsider because that is not, we're in a, in a global uh, economy that is as fragile as it is. This is not. Okay, we go to Jacques Boudreau from the Libertarian Party for your take on that question. 
Thank you. Well, of course, the tax code is a, it's a Byzantine, uh, so complex. It's uh, 800 pages now with all kinds of boutique tax cuts and credits and what have you, which doesn't make any sense at all. It makes it so difficult that most of us either need a software or a professional to help us. It, totally unacceptable um, situation. Our platform in terms of taxes is very simple. We increase the uh, basic exemption to 17300 We go to a flat tax of 15%, which would help absolutely everybody, including the single, who, again, would not be, in a way, not look after uh, the way the, the current system is. And we would simplify the system with only four additional exemptions for uh, child, students, elderly, and disabled. And we'll leave it at that. Uh, it would be simplified, make it easier for people to um, file their income tax return. Thank you. Thank you very much. We go to NDP candidate Matthew Rowlandson now. With respect to Ed, the conservative tax policies have been anything but universal. In particular, their income tax splitting scheme benefits only two parent families and only two parent families in which one parent works and the other one stays home. I, you know, I always thought conservatives weren't supposed to pick winners and losers. But in this case, they're privileging certain kinds of families, and with this benefit, offering nothing to single parents and nothing to return to the original question to singles. Now, I don't believe that the tax code should be a scheme for social engineering, and I do believe in the promise of universality. The question was, what would an NDP government do for singles, and particularly for urban singles? The answer would be, improve our infrastructure have a housing policy in Canada that makes it possible for young people to live in our cities. Raise the minimum wage. A lot of singles, a lot of young singles are living on minimum wage. We need to raise the minimum wage to a level that people can afford to live on. Thank you very much. And I know we saw a hand go up from Ed there, so we'll give you a chance to reply. Well, only because he uh, mentioned me specifically, so I thought I should respond to that if I might. We've introduced things like the tax-free savings account that friends here have opposed. Uh, not only have we put it in place, we've increased it and then we doubled it. And we did that to put more money into all families' hands, be they singles, be they uh, couples, be they seniors. Uh, and, and the impact of that has been huge. Some 11 million Canadians take advantage of the tax-free savings account. Uh, and the, the other point I want to come back to is that when we talk about singles, we oh. talk about parents that... There we go. Sorry, oh, got to cut. We got to go right to Michael now for his take on Devin's question. Okay. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I can definitely speak at this. I've lived on my own um, for about 20 years, and uh, I find it, you know, slightly more difficult paying for everything, housing, food, uh, you name it, because it's I'm not sharing with anyone. Um, <clears throat> but I uh, agree with uh, Matthew. There is that you know raising the minimum wage. Um, our policy is to 19% or $19 an hour. Um, definitely remove the uh, Tory income splitting plan, which basically um, is is only um, useful for the you know the, the more wealthy of us that uh, can afford to have a you know somebody to stay home, um, <coughs> and that uh, that money can go towards um, giving tax breaks. Um, our policy is for anybody under. Uh, making under $40,000 a year really shouldn't be paying any income tax at all. And that's our policy. Thank you very much. We go to Kate Young with the Liberals now. Thank you, Jess. I, I did want to start with the, the tax-free savings account because I wanted to underscore that the Liberals uh, like the tax-free savings account. We just don't like the, the, uh, the Conservatives' idea of, of doubling it uh, from, uh, well, 5500 to 10000 We think that's taking too much money out of the economy and it's only really supporting about 15% of Canadians. So that's not really working very well uh, by doubling it. But as far as single Canadians are concerned and people who live in this community, I think uh, our infrastructure program is exactly what is needed to get jobs and uh, talk about uh, what we're going to do as far as infrastructure in uh, the London region. It would be up to the municipalities how the money is spent and they may decide that rapid transit is the way to go. And that's something that I know that uh, would be uh, music to the ears of many young Londoners. Thank you very much. We go to Dimitri Lascaris from the Greens. Thank you. Well, one thing uh, that my opponents have not mentioned is the family law system. A lot of single parents uh, in this country got that way uh, after a failed marriage. And uh, regrettably, what we have in this country is an adversarial system dealing with a problem that is quintessentially non-adversarial. 
This causes uh, broken families to expend enormous amounts of their household wealth on lawyers. Uh, it causes trauma to children. And we want to create a system of family law that is non-adversarial, that takes it out of that context, which creates, it does little more than enrich lawyers and creates that trauma. And also to uh, create a default uh, of equal parenting under the law, which should be subject to uh, certain uh, limited exceptions. And that would really minimize the conflicts that lead to uh, a lot of the troubles that single parents have nowadays. Thank you very much. We will now move on to our next question from Sean Meyer of Our London. How will your party ensure that cities are sustainable and vibrant in today's economy? Okay, so our first response will come from Jacques Boudreau. Well, this is a federal election. There's uh, no jurisdiction for federal parties to get involved in municipal affairs. Uh, quite frankly, the Libertarian Party <coughs> would just let the, the cities um, manage their books on their own and, and manage their affairs. There's, once again, this, this impetus for people to want to rule people's lives, to get involved in all kinds of stuff with no expertise whatsoever. Um, it's not people in Ottawa who should start dictating what happens in London or Sarnia or whatever it happens to be. I mean, they're not there. Uh, this is, um, frankly, none of federal parties' business. Thank you. Okay, and now we will go to our new Democrat candidate, Matthew Rowlandson, for his thoughts. Cities do an enormous, cities and municipalities do an, the enormous majority of the infrastructure work in this country on a far too small fraction of the tax base. To begin with, they need more money. They need more money for transit. They need more money to address the huge infrastructure deficit that has accumulated over the last 20 years of budget cuts from both liberal and conservative governments. The NDP will begin by doing what city councillors I've spoken to in London say they've been asking for for years, which is allowing municipalities to take an extra cent of the, of the already existing gas tax and apply it to their infrastructure needs. We recognize that cities have unmet public transit needs. They have unmet needs in, uh, in, in, in digital technology involving, uh, in, in, in involving optical, op optical uh, infrastructure going to offices. All of these things are needed if we are to have the vibrant city centers that are, where jobs will come that we need to have here in London. Thank you very much. Our next reply will come from Michael Lewis of the Communist Party. All right. um, <coughs> to use a, a military metaphor, cities, um, <coughs> are the troops on the ground, uh, where the provincial um, governments would be, you could <laughs> say that they are like the, uh, uh, the generals, um, and then up from there. Um, <clears throat> but we, our plan would be to uh, deliver stable statutory transfers to cover the real cost of city services, um, or deliver new wealth taxing powers to the cities themselves. Um, <clears throat> a, lot of <laughs> a lot of responsibility uh, back in the in the 90s was uh, downloaded from uh, the Harris government. Um, now I realize that's provincial, but uh, it's still a lot that was dumped on the cities, and we think we should upload those those previous downloads. Um, adequate function uh, funding for uh, public transit, for health, uh, housing, uh, child care, and social assistance, and um, return 50% of the gas tax. Thank you very much. On to Kate Young with the Liberals, please. Yes, uh, making sure that a city is sustainable and vibrant, you need money from uh, all levels of government. And of course, a federal liberal government would be interested in having uh, the largest investment in infrastructure in Canadian history. And that is what we need to get this, uh, this city moving again and to make it vibrant and sustainable. But what we also need is, is discussion within, uh, between the federal and the municipal governments and the provincial, and that's something that is lacking with the leadership on Ottawa today. We have to start that discussion. Thank you very much. We go to Dimitri Lascaris from the Green Party. Well, I certainly agree, and as does the Green Party, with my friend Matthew Rowlandson from the NDP about <coughs> the essential need to invest in mass transit. There's no question about that. But fundamentally, our lifestyle in our cities is not going to be rendered sustainable until we wean ourselves off our dependence on oil. And that means we have to put a fair price on carbon. Right now, oil is affordable and can be sold profitably by oil companies because they're foisting the costs of their production and the consumption of oil on everybody else. That's a fa there's a fancy economic word for it. It's called externalization. We need to internalize those costs and build them back into the price of oil. And that will give private sector, the private sector, the, the incentive it needs to shift to a clean, renewable energy economy. Without that, we cannot 
have a sustainable lifestyle in this country. It's as simple as that, and the Green Party is the only party that recognizes that and will act on it. Thank you very much. Now to Conservative candidate Ed Holder. Well, thanks very much. It's important to understand that uh, cities are creatures of the province, and as a result of that, there's this relationship that we have with the provinces for cities across the country in terms of support. One of the things that we introduced uh, uh, and, and uh, was the Building Canada Fund, which is the largest infrastructure commitment that we've made, and that was just announced in our 2015 budget. Uh, and, w and, and if the City of London is focused on that and is interested in, for example, the, uh, the uh, transit system they're talking about, what they can do is they can approach the province. If the province deems that to be a priority, they, go that way, they can go that way and approach the federal government for, for support. The other thing that's important to remember is that uh, we had in place the gas tax fund. What we did was we made it permanent, then we doubled it, then we indexed it, and then we expanded the categories so that cities like London, which now receives some 21 million in change annually, can invest in major projects to sustain themselves for the kind of deficit situation uh, that they talked that uh, in terms of what they're in. Okay, thank you very much. We're now heading off to another question. This one is from Pat Maloney with London Free Press. A former London MP was convicted of stealing taxpayer money while sitting in government, but is still collecting a six-figure public pension. What can you tell voters who are outraged by that? And our first response will come from the Democrat candidate, Matthew Rowlandson. I can tell them that I'm outraged too. You were referring to Joe Fontana, who was convicted of stealing taxpayer money while he was a member of Paul Martin's cabinet in the last Liberal government. Um, Joe's story is an embarrassment, and we don't ever want to see anything like that again. Um, the, general, the whole question of the administration of public funds, the cover-ups around it, have affected both conservative and liberal governments that we've seen in the, last, in, in the last decade. We've had too many scandals. I don't think scandals are the major, the central issue in this campaign. Really, it's about the economy, the environment, cities, but the fact is, we've been watching the Duffy trial for the last month. We remember Joe Fontana. We need a government from a party that has a different history in Canada. The NDP, the NDP is a party of, that began with small, with workers and small farmers. We are thrifty and honest, and we will run a clean government. There we go. And we are go now to Michael Lewis with the Communist. All right. Um, yeah, I think uh, the big problem is the issue of um, what seems to be political immunity. Um, I think politicians need to be uh, subject to the same laws um, as regular citizens and on top of that I think there needs to be more oversight um, on all MPs and, and their, um, and their su supporters, their um, <coughs> assistants and whatnot uh, just to guarantee that something like this and, and, and like the Senate scandal um, won't happen again. Thank you. Thank you very much. We go to Kate Young with the Liberals. What we need and what the Liberals are calling for is a more transparent government because the problem has uh, continues to surface and we have to get to the, to the main focus here is that we have to be open and transparent about what we're doing and what uh, members of parliament are spending money on. It just, ha we have to be an open book. And that's one of the reasons I decided to run because I, I felt that people had lost faith in their members of parliament and in any politician. And I decided that I needed to step up and try to make a difference, and that's what I plan to do. Thank you very much. We now go to Dimitri Lascaris with uh, the Green Party for your response. Well, there are, uh, there are many people in Canadian politics, politics today who are fine individuals, but the fact of the matter is there are many who are not fit to govern, and Joe Fontana was certainly one of those people. And a, a fundamental problem we have in this country is there's too much money in politics. And we need to level the playing field for political parties. We need to increase public funding for political parties. We need to decrease the limits on campaign contributions, particularly corporate cam campaign contributions, because to be perfectly blunt about it, corporations don't want honest people, generally speaking, in government. They want people that they can manipulate to their own advantage. And we have to put an end to that. And until we do, we're not going to attract across the board the quality of individuals uh, that we need in order to govern our country properly. Thank you very much. We now go to Conservative candidate Ed Holder. I don't think it's appropriate uh, uh, at this stage now to talk about our former mayor who frankly was charged, convicted and, uh, and has uh, had to deal with that and frankly that public shaming, uh, he's gone through that. 
You know, my kid Brett and mom said, you got two things in your life. You have your name and your integrity, and you don't mess up one, one without messing up the other. It's one of the things that why we've done in terms of the Elections Act. We've been really clear that uh, we've uh, eliminated uh, corporate uh, donations. We've eliminated business donations. So those influences can't uh, play a part in the electoral process. Uh, we've el eliminated the per, uh, per vote subsidy as well because we're trying to be tax responsible on behalf of the taxpayer. But I think in light of those kinds of issues, uh, it always still strikes me interesting that uh, even in the last uh, in the last session in Parliament, our Board of Internal Economy, run by parliamentarians, said that the NDP had abused taxpayer funds to some millions of dollars and and their response was it was a kangaroo court and, uh, and, and that they wouldn't acknowledge it. Integrity starts right at home. All right, and with that belding, we're going to go right to Matthew Rowlandson with the NDP for a 30-second rebuttal. The Board of Internal Economy is a parliamentary committee. It's a political committee, and it's dominated by members of the other parties. The NDP's position throughout this, throughout this discussion has been that we wish to be judged in a, league, in a court of law. The accusations, the completely unfounded accusations of impropriety that the Conservatives and the Liberals have been lodging are about NDP use of public money for political outreach. There's no suggestion whatsoever that anybody is lining their own pockets. We're using this money to contact the And we'll leave it there. Over to Jacques Boudreau of the uh, Libertarian Party. Thank you. So what we've heard from these parties is a staunch defense of the status quo. More of the same, the same buzzwords about transparency and it doesn't work. Every party at, of every uh, color at, uh, whether it's federal or provincial, has had scandal. Every single one of them, or an, uh, a review from the Auditor General finding huge mismanagement of fund, it's always the same. And more promises of the same are going to give us the same result. If we want to um, avoid scandals or whatever, we've got to make the government as small as possible. That way, you've got far less opportunities to steal from the people. Thank you. Okay, and we will move on to our next question, which comes from Andrew Lawton of AM980. A lot of the discussion in the early days of the campaign focused on Canada's intervention in northern Iraq and Syria against ISIS, as well as national security issues. Do you feel these are important issues for Canadians and for Londoners, or are these a distraction from other issues that Canadians should be focused on? Thank you for the question. We will now go to Michael Lewis for your reply. Uh, yes, um, I believe they are a distraction, actually. Um, our policy is um, <coughs> to cut military spending um, and put those towards, uh, you know, um, infrastructure and um, social programs, health care and whatnot. Um, the problem with, um, for example, the going to Syria after ISIS, um, it's always seemed odd to me that ISIS seems to be such a great problem, yet Boko Haram and uh, um, <coughs> Boko Haram and hold on a second, <laughs> can't remember the other group. <coughs> Boko Haram and Al Shabaab. Um, it's funny how the we seem to attack uh, countries that are oil rich, um, and then African countries we kind of leave them alone. Um, I wouldn't, you know, that's almost like saying that the lives of you know sixty. African children are worth less than the lives of three or four Western And we'll have to orders. leave it there, unfortunately. Kate, uh, over to you for your reply. Well, we agree that what is happening in Syria and Iraq is creating uh, a, a terrible humanitarian crisis. Um, but the Liberal Party has never opposed deploying armed forces into combat when it clearly serves Canada's national interest. But that's where it ends, and that's where we have a, a major problem. And uh, we think that we should be considering what we can do as far as humanitarian uh, aid is concerned, and do that as quickly as possible, uh, because the situation re gets worse daily. Okay, thank you very much. We go now to Dimitri Lascaris from the Green Party for your thoughts. Well, I don't think Canada should become isolationist. I think that it's one world that we live in, and we have to do what we can in order to ensure peace and stability in other parts of the world, including Iraq and Syria. But unfortunately, Mr. Harper seems to think that every geopolitical problem is a nail, and the Canadian military is a hammer, and he's got to hit it with military force. He's wrong. The greatness of this country lies in the path of peace and not of war. And what we favor in the, in the Green Party is a solution of political inclusion, 
giving humanitarian aid to these re re regions, starving the combatants of the weapons that they use in order to commit atrocities. That is the way forward. That is the way in which we can create a ge geopolitically stable world in which uh, all people, including Canadians, can prosper. Thank you very much. We now go to Conservative candidate Ed Holder. So let's be clear. Without security, there can be no liberty. You know, I was in Ottawa when uh, Parliament was attacked and a soldier lost his life at the War Memorial. And the week before, lest anyone forget, uh, Warrant Officer Vincent was brutally run down by another uh, jihadist. And to suggest that that can happen in London, Ontario, we only have to look in our own riding here in London West where two young students were turned and uh, frankly were very active overseas internationally in the jihadist movement and created heinous crimes. I think all of us would agree how sad that is and, 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 and brutal that is. What this security legislation is designed to do is to help authorities stop attacks, get threats off our streets, uh, criminalize the promotion of terrorism and prevent terrorists uh, from traveling and recruiting others. You know, it's rather interesting because... Unfortunately, so we'll, have to, we'll have to leave it there. Uh, Dimitri, did you want to yes, have uh, a... Okay, go ahead. Yes, uh, those are certainly regrettable inc incidents and ought to be a concern to us all. There's no question about it, but the fact remains, Mr. Holder, that uh, a Canadian has more chance of being struck by lightning than being killed by a terrorist. And fundamentally, we have to deal with this problem in a way that is going to preserve our civil liberties and c calm the geopolitical instability that we find in this world. The approach of the Conservative government is one of militarism, one of bombastic saber rattling, and it is making the world less safe for Canadians and for all of us, frankly. Thank you very much. And uh, Ed will be our final rebuttal on this one. Go ahead. I'll just give you two names to that. Vincent and Cirillo, two soldiers that gave their lives because it does happen in this country. And by the way, the issues that impacted uh, uh, young students here in, in London and London South happened here in our community. Frankly, uh, with what we have seen with uh, via rail uh, challenges, with subway issues right across this country, there are the, the terrorism threat is real. We have to be sensitive to it because there's nothing greater for the responsibility of a government than to take care of the security of its, of its citizens. Thank you very much. We now go to Jacques Boudreau for your take on this question. Thank you. Well, the response from Mr. Holder is typical of governments who first try very hard to scare you so that somehow or another they can come in with all kinds of laws and regulations and what have you to control your lives, to minimize your freedom. It's totally unacceptable. Um, he's talking about local uh, incidents. Uh, the question was about Syria. Um, we have no business in Syria. We should get out of there as quickly as possible. This idea, again, the arrogance of governments and these other parties who think that they can go in there knowing nothing about the people, about their customs, about their laws or whatever, and decide to say, yes, we're going to bring democracy because that's what you need, is complete nonsense. It doesn't work. The situation right now in Syria, Syria and Iraq is worse than it used to be. You know, we may claim that <coughs> Saddam Hussein was a terrible person, but um, what we've done by toppling him is no better. In fact, in many ways it might be worse. So this idea that we can go and change things around. And we'll leave it there. Uh, Ed, do you want a chance to reply to that, or should we move on to Matthew for his thoughts? The final point I would make to that Since you were directly mentioned, I should thank you. Thank that. you very much. Is that when ISIL rapes and cuts off the heads of little kids, when they put adults in cages and when they sell the women as sex slaves, yes, we have to be involved. That's a commitment of a caring community that has a broader obligation. Thank you very much for that. We will move on now to Matthew Rowlandson with the NDP. The NDP does not support the offensive military action that Canada has undertaken against ISIL in, area, in Syria and Iraq. I don't think there's, there's any need for conspiracy theories to describe it as a distraction. I don't think we need to say that it's about oil. But we, we believe in a strong Canadian military, um, but we believe that it should be used, as the Canadian military always has been, in concert with international organizations. This mission is essentially the United States and Canada freelancing against ISIL. It's not a, road, it's not a, it's not a choice that, can, that will be effective. What we need to do is work with international organizations to provide humanitarian aid, to provide aid to the enormous numbers of re refugees this situation is creating. I yield to no one in my loathing of ISIL, 
I even hate to call it that because it's not Islamic and it's not a state. But nonetheless, this is not a problem that can be addressed by freelancing adventurism using the, Cana using the ca Canadian military. Okay, we are running tight on time, but if your comment is super short, Dimitri, go for it. There's one person who voted against the bombardment of Libya, the continuation of that bombardment. It was Elizabeth May. Now what we have there is utter chaos. And for the first time, Islamic uh, extremists, violent extremists, have taken a foothold in the country. That is a direct result of the militaristic approach of Canada and other countries in NATO. Okay, we are going to leave it there because we need to move on to our next question, which is actually our last one, and it's a bit of a, a, a quick fire round, if you will. <laughs> our, our typical responses have been a minute each, and after this question, there'll be 30 seconds. So here it comes. What is your party's stance on the legalization of marijuana? And Kate is the next person that's going to answer that. Kate Young with the Liberals. Well, the Liberals believe that uh, we should be legalizing and regulating marijuana. Le legalizing will get it out of the hands of the criminals. And if you're just going to decriminalize marijuana, that means that uh, our young people are still going to have to go to criminals to buy marijuana. Uh, Canada has the largest number of teens that are getting, uh, getting uh, this drug, and we have got to regulate it and get it out of the hands of teens. And with so that, we have to cut it off. I'm so sorry. This yeah. is this is tight. It's 30 seconds. It's tough to get it all in there. Uh, to Dimitri now for your take on this. The Green Party agrees it should be legalized, it should be regulated, and it should be taxed and become a significant source of revenue. And I have a question for Mr. Holder. The scientific evidence shows conclusively that abuse of alcohol is far more damaging to human health than the consumption of marijuana. Is he going to propose to ban the uh, consumption of alcohol? I don't think so. That's sheer hypocrisy, and it's another example of the uh, policies of the government, of, of the Conservative government, being completely divorced from scientific fact. Okay, and we go to Conservative MP, or rather, candidate at Holder. Well, thanks very much. The Conservative government wants to stop kids from smoking marijuana. Um, I agree with Kate that Canada uh, has to get uh, teens uh, away from smoking marijuana, and yet her Liberal policies encourage it. And it was the Liberal leader who, frankly, is not discouraging youth from, from smoking marijuana. Uh, and, and from our standpoint, to make it easier for children to buy and, uh, and, and smoke marijuana, frankly, is, is disastrous. There isn't one police officer, there isn't one police chief who says that that doesn't lead to other drugs. Jacques Boudreau. Thank you. Well, the current situation makes criminal out of people who are not criminal. It's completely unacceptable and it should be legalized as quickly as possible. The, uh, once again, it's, this is interference on the part of the state of people who want to tell us what we can or cannot consume uh, when it leads to no problem to others. People should be free to operate their lives as they see fit. And um, yes, that's it. Thank you. Okay, Matthew Rowlandson with the NDP. The NDP position is that the use and uh, cultivation of small quantities of marijuana should be decriminalized. Nobody should go to jail. Nobody should have their lives ruined for smoking a joint. The establishment of an entire new regime of taxation, of distribution, and of government regulation that would be necessary if, the, if pot is to be legalized is something that's beyond our scope, and we don't think the Canadians are going to give us a mandate to do it in this election. And lastly, we go to Michael Lewis with the Communist Party. Okay. Um, I will be totally honest here. I, uh, I was nominated on Thursday, and this is one of the, one of the uh, aspects that I, of the party platform that I haven't completely verified but um, from what I do remember um, I'm pretty sure that uh, we agree with with Kate and the Liberals that uh, it should be legalized and regulated um, same as alcohol thank you and now I know Ed you wanted to say something but we are on such a tight schedule that we've got to get to our clothing closing statements not our clothing statements <laughs> Jeez. oh we're all in nice blazers um, <laughs> so that marks the end of our debate portion of the program so now we will hear our closing statements from our candidates which will go in the reverse order of our opening statements you will have 30 seconds it is a tight lightning round of uh, closing statements so bunch else we start with Matthew Rollinson Thank you very much. This has been a terrific conversation. 30 seconds. London is a terrific city. I've lived here and lived in the riding since 2002. We have a hard-working, highly trained population, and we should be and we are in the middle of an extraordinary fertile agricultural region. We should be doing better than we are. Tom Mulcair came to London 
and promised to be a champion for Canadian manufacturers. I'm proud to be in his party and to work with him. And I hope that in October 19th, you will support and We'll stop there to Jacques Boudreau. Thank you. Throughout human history, prosperity has always been associated with personal freedom and limited governments. That is why small states like Hong Kong and Singapore that score among the highest on the Freedom Index also routinely top the charts of the wealthiest countries in spite of having close to natural resources. The Libertarian Party wants to reduce the size of government, reduce tax issues and regulation, give back your freedom, and in doing so, allow the free market and entrepreneurs to increase wealth for all, particularly for the poor. Come Election Day, please vote Libertarian. Over to our Conservative candidate, Ed Holder. Thanks, friends. Canada is not immune to the fragile global economy, yet under the leadership of Prime Minister Harper, we've weathered the economic stability with a plan of low taxes, a balanced budget, economic growth, and benefits provided directly to families. Canada has the strongest job creation record and strongest income growth for the middle class amongst any of the major developed economies. That contrasts to a plan of high taxes, high debt, and high deficits, which is failing everywhere else. So on Election Day, choose the party best able to manage the economy. For Canada's sake, for your family's sake, choose the Conservative Party. Thank you very much. Dimitri Lascaris with the Greens. Uh, I haven't prepared a closing statement, uh, but I must say this. I've sat here for an hour and I've listened to my colleagues. We've all been courteous with each other, but uh, not one of them has mentioned climate change. The United Nations Secretary General has stated clearly and with complete justification that it is the defining crisis of our time and these people have nothing to say about the defining crisis of our time. Thank you very much. To Kate Young with the Liberals. Thank you very much. First I want to thank Rogers Television uh, for giving us this opportunity today and this election is a clear choice between a government that wants to make smart investments uh, that create jobs and growth and deal with climate change because it is a very important issue or governments that want austerity measures and cuts that will slow the economy further. The people of London West need a voice in Ottawa and not the other way around and I would be honoured to be that. Thank you for that. Kate, we go to Michael Lewis with the Communist Party. Okay. Uh, this global crisis that Canada finds itself in, it's not just about government policies, it's about capitalism itself. Uh, it's time for a new system, one based on full democracy, full employment, human equality, and environmental sustainability. Um, and one in which the country's resources and economic wealth are owned and controlled by the working class rather than the upper crust. The wealth of a country should not be gauged by its wealthy citi wealthiest citizens. It should be gauged by the wealth of its least affluent. Uh, on, the, on October 19th, there we go. Thank you so much. That was tough, very difficult, but thank you to all of our candidates for taking part. This is the end of our debate. I'd like to say a big thank you to everyone that's taking part today, all of our candidates and our journalists and uh, London Youth Advisory Council members who gave us questions. If you're interested in watching this debate or others in the series, make sure you go to our website and check out the local campaign page, rogerstv.com. So once again, my name is Jess Brady. Please join us again next time as we put the local focus on the federal election.